Hello, everyone. This is Lee Andrews with Akathame, and today we're going to be talking to Samantha about accessibility. Samantha is going to introduce herself and the organization that she's with and what she does. But in a nutshell, this is what she does. She allows the world to have access so that they can maintain their independence. And for that, I am very grateful. So we're going to get right into this. Samantha, tell us about who you are, what you do in the association that they're with and what they do. So my name is Samantha Evans and I'm the certification manager for the International Association of Accessibility Professionals. So our organization is a professional society and it encompasses people who work in accessibility in a variety of roles across every niche of business, across all industries. Oops, did we lose her? I think we lost connection for a second, sorry. Just for a second, that's okay, keep going. So, um, so that's what our professional society does and we work really to, to make sure that we educate and, um, and inform and kind of lift the, the uncertainty about what accessibility means and how you can incorporate it at work. And uh, we like to do that. I manage a certification program that offers kind of a benchmark of standards of core competencies in accessibility, no matter what you do for work. Um, so they talk about disabilities and assistive technology and then universal design learning and how that's incorporated into digital tech and then laws and regulations around the world and um, and how you incorporate accessibility into business. So that's our, our key foundation. So you are you are the, the person to know and the place to go <laughs> when we're trying to evaluate, assess or correct what we are doing with our with our ability to be accessible for individuals with whatever that means. Right. Mm -hmm. That's okay. that's that's what all of our members do. And it's really an amazing group of people. How many members do you have? Um, we are in 62 countries around the world and probably wow. a little better than 30,000 people, individuals around the world and, and, and several thousand organizational members as well. Okay, so now I'm gonna ask a little bit of a controversial question. So here you have 30,000 members, you are in 62 countries and yet accessibility seems to still be difficult <laughs> for for companies to achieve. And I am going to put this one quote up that says applying for a job can be exclusive. This is what we talked about before we went live. At 21st century, 30,000 members of your organization, and yet still we are having trouble with this. Why do you think that is? So I think there's a lot of great thought about I want to we want to talk about accessibility and inclusion and people with disabilities but we forget to connect the dots about the systems and the processes that we use and so um, the first hurdle you find is in applying for a job is number one is the system accessible can I use assistive technology or my keyboard or text-to-speech or some other tool to engage with the application system um, that's the first hurdle um, then the second hurdle is um, is does the job description include things that exclude me? Um, I read a job description last week in a in a public uh, educational setting that said you must be able to read with visual acuity, must have a firm handshake, um, and make direct eye contact. Those are all great attributes for engagement, but they're clearly exclusionary to somebody who may wear glasses. <laughs> or use a magnifier on their screen or may have, you know, a physical disability. And so uh, I think that we have grown accustomed to seeing those those phrases and things without considering the fact that they may exclude really amazing candidates and people in our lives. I'm going to assume that that job description that you're referring to was not for an airline pilot. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it was in a it was in an academic institution. So <laughs> So if academic institutions are being that exclusive and academic institutions are the place for learning and growing and adapting to modern things and keeping the world current and educated to perform in that new world, 
could this be a, a bigger hurdle than than just not having corporate adoption? Are we teaching the next generation how to be inclusive? I think some people are, and I think some programs are teaching and expanding that thought, but I don't know that it's built in. And so um, in the accessibility world, you'll have people say, is accessibility baked right in as if it was part of a recipe that it's not your 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 baked good isn't going to succeed if you don't include you know accessibility in your recipe so um I think that in higher ed, the first challenge students face is getting access to their materials. Um, so think about textbooks. If you can't carry a textbook, how do you get a digital copy? And if your digital copy requires you to use a computer to read it, not your eyes. So there's that's material accessibility. So we have a long way to go, but it's really amazing to see companies adopting um, diversity and inclusion that does include people with disabilities and accessibility as part of that discussion, not just the growth and, and, and progress we're seeing about racial, ethnic, gender, and, um, and other diversity inclusion. If you were to, if you were to say, Lee, if you really want to, if you really want to benchmark yourself against the best that's out there, do you have an institution or organization that you think is is setting that setting that bar of inclusion and diversity and all that stuff? You know, there are some really amazing companies that that do great things across the board, but there are literally, I would have to go through a list of several dozen. Um, in the US and UK and in Europe and in Latin America, there are lots that are doing great things. I think what's really interesting is um, Caroline Casey is uh, has an initiative that is <laughs> is looking for 500 companies to bring accessibility and inclusion to the boardroom discussion. Wow. So, and um, she's looking for 500 companies for the C-level suite to say, we are going to make accessibility and inclusion part of our corporate culture and our strategy, not just um, if you find humor, their program they ran last year was diverse-ish. Like, hey, when is accessibility going to be part of your discussion? Oh, in 2025, we're certainly going to talk about it then and, you know, ish. So um, there are some companies that do great things. The first thing you'll see is if they actually have an accessibility policy on their footer of their website or as a statement, um, that's your first step. Um, just like you would expect to see, you know, information about EEOC if you're in the United States for equal employment opportunities and, and those sorts of things. Um, accessibility statements are a great way for a company to talk about their personnel and their technical approaches to accessibility and inclusion. And so you just brought up technical and, and, and otherwise. So accessibility is not just about technology. Is that correct? No, I think in started I, technology, though. Technology is certainly a way that a lot of people engage with the world today, but I think most people are familiar with physical space, the built environment accessibility. People are used to seeing the international blue symbol of a person using a wheelchair, thinking about accessible space, um, accessible uh, parking spaces and automatic door openers and braille on elevator doors and those sorts of things. So accessibility, I think, for most Americans was originally thought of 30 years ago when the ADA first was put into place as uh, accessibility for disabled Americans in access to physical spaces. But as the world has transitioned to being both physical space and the digital world, accessibility is now incorporated into both of those. And HR, we know that this is all about people. So people first is, is always to be at the heart of the matter. I was not aware before we talked because I am the lowest common denominator in this subject matter and I freely admit that, but I was not aware that the the vibration on my cell phone, that haptic, is actually part of accessibility from years ago. It is. And so the deaf and hard of hearing community have used haptics for a lot of years once electronics progressed to be a physical vibration or an alert to let somebody who's deaf or hard of hearing know that there's a sound happening. Um, and so uh, if you use your phone on vibrate to let you know that you have a message or a text or, or something coming in, that, that haptic is an accessibility feature that's been part of the deaf and hard of hearing community accessibility for a lot of years. 
And the flashing light, if you turn on the, the light to flash to let you know so that you have a visual cue, um, that's also an accessibility feature. If you talk to Siri, Google, or it, whatever your home device is, that text-to-speech functionality is, is part of the accessibility world that allows people to engage with technology without using their mouse or their hands, using their voice. So it's, 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 it's as if these accessible features, these features that were created for accessibility actually help all the users, right? This is not, this went way beyond. They're just things that make our lives easier. They are. Our, easier they are. Lives. And that's the beauty of accessibility is that when you build accessibility into your product service or delivery, it enhances the experience for everyone and includes everyone. So not only do you get the widest reach for your business, your service, your experience, your event, your activity, but it enhances the experience for everyone. So when we think about things that are accessibility features, it's not just for captions on videos are not just for the deaf and hard of hearing community. Captions are a great way to have automatic organic SEO because every word in your captions is searchable on crawlers and indexers on the web. But captions are great for people who prefer to see and hear at the same time or have a, a, a reading disability or perhaps don't speak the language you're presenting in as their primary language. There's all sorts of reasons that captions are a great enhancement to the entire experience. Um, and if you think about the way people engage with video content, uh, Verizon and um, Publicist did a study last year and 80% of people on mobile devices engage with video with not with the volume turned off. So without the captions, you can't tell the funny story or the heartfelt mission. So um, so captionings are a really easy way to, to engage. And I think that's how you and I originally started talking was kind of about captions and, and text to speech, too. OK, I did not real another aha. Uh -huh. It, did you say that 80% of people don't have, they don't have the, these are hearing abled people. They don't have the, the sound on. Is that because they're in environments where it, they shouldn't have the sound on, like sitting on a train like we used to? Yeah, we're like on a, on a train or are, I kind of joke like were you in your meeting and you weren't supposed to be watching the funny cat video, but you really wanted to see. I mean, there's lots of reasons that people choose not to turn on the volume, whether they're in a public space or on a train or whether they just, you know, they want to see what it is. So. So you touched on the fact that if we make accessibility part of our user experience strategy and the design of these products, that we can expand market share, really. We, we expand the, the opportunity to sell these products across not only you know, certain groups, but throughout the lifetime of that person. Like you're making things accessible from sunrise to sunset in somebody's life. That, that's pretty big, right? It is. And, and if you consider, I heard a phrase a few months ago that I really like is that we're not, all of us are maybe not yet disabled. Yeah. All of us, if we live long enough, we'll age into a disability if we don't acquire a temporary disability through an injury or an illness. So um, with the aging population, you have to consider, we, we accept that as we age, our vision and our hearing decline. But that means that we need to be able to have the world available to people so that they can magnify it, make it brighter, easier to read, listen to instead of see. Um, so we're all going to acquire a disability at some point in time. Um, and we probably have all had a disability in a temporary fashion at some point in time. People aren't born with disabilities for all their lives necessarily. And I think that's a concept. Um, there are also disabilities that you can't see. And um, the neurodiversity in, in disability and accessibility is, is really interesting because people on the neurodiverse spectrum have amazing talents for patterns and, wow. and are really great at, at finding details. And so companies like Ernst & Young have complete programs designed for hiring people on the autism spectrum because they've identified this rich talent pool. And if you can find a way to expand that to benefit your business model, why not? It's interesting that you say that there's a group of kids that I'm working, well, not working with, but they've asked me to be one of their testers as part of the recruiting uh, industry. And um, they've built this, um, they're actually building what I think is a staffing company for, what did you call it? Neurodiverse, Neurodiverse. Neurodiverse um, individuals 
to make it easier for them to apply for work. And then they're going to be working, ideally, they're going to be working with companies to help them reshape their job descriptions and reshape their entire um, you know, application process. I mean, th this is this was wonderful for me to see because some of these these kids haven't even graduated yet, right? And then some have their master's degree, and and to see them realizing that there's a whole group of individuals that are largely untapped in the world, not just in America, but in the world, and for them to act to to intentionally reach out to them and say, hey, come on, be a part of this. We know you've got something to offer. Let's figure out how we can connect these dots to what you do in the business. And I'm thinking to myself, these kids are really smart because these are economic buyers that a lot of these individuals who aren't being put to work are often a drain on, on the economy, right? Or a drain in their own homes or what have you, but, but trying to make them, but to include them into this world changes their lives and the entire structure of of the the, the face of the, of the the planet right i mean human nature yeah people with disabilities are are inherently underemployed underemployed and um and unemployed uh you know those two are not mutually exclusive huh. so um but when people with disabilities find the ability to find a job in a company that respects and 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 values them the engagement that that the company gets in return is tremendous. Um, but I think that there's a fear of not knowing how to provide accommodations and accommodations aren't a one-on-one -on -one basis. So, um, but many people with disabilities are afraid to disclose that they have a disability at hiring because there is a, a perception that is based in some forms of reality that hiring managers will not include somebody with a disability if they disclose they have one. We're sliding ourselves, aren't we, Samantha? We, we really are. And it's, it's, it's really unfortunate, but I think it's because of the fear of the unknown. And so if we can work to lift some of that fear and say, Hey, you know what? Windows and iOS environments have built in text to speech and Chrome and Safari have built in uh, magnifiers on their screens. So you can, there's a lot of built in technology that is it, it, it's omnipresent in the tools that we use that will accommodate a lot of disabilities so that a hiring manager, an onboarding manager, or training manager doesn't have to think I have to go out and buy tens of thousands of dollars of equipment necessarily for some disabilities. But other things are readily available that will enable somebody to do an amazing job. But we have to give people a chance and we need to make sure that that inclusive approach is part of every day, not just an exception to the rule. I want to go back. Opinion. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it, you're right. It, it doesn't. Need, it shouldn't be the exception to the rule. Like ev ev everything that we look at should be evaluated for accessibility, right? And mm -hmm. one thing that uh, Naomi Mercer said: as long as we are inclusive, we will always be diverse. It's true, and and that really uh, struck a chord with me. And um, and 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 I don't think that we realize how our biases, how programmed our biases are, whether regardless if they're based on fear or not, they are they are just in, they are ingrained in us. So yeah. the, the next question is is how when you go into an organization or when you are talking to somebody who is trying to help their organization become more accessible, what are some of the, what, what are the first one or two things that you look at to determine what level of accessibility that organization actually has? I, I, you probably have a checklist and, a, and all kinds of things, but what are the, what are the first one or two things that really stand out? So there are a wide variety of what are called maturity models. And so there are accessibility maturity models that several organizations have created. Many of them are available online and free. But the first level, like you start at one, but some people are still trying to get to one. So whether or not there's, <laughs> I mean, we don't, we don't all start at one. Sometimes we start at zero and move towards one. <laughs> so maturity okay. model scales are usually from, from zero to five. Um, but so the first thing is, you know, do you have a policy? Is there an accessibility policy? Does your diversity and inclusion policy include accessibility in people with disabilities? Um, do you have a part of your technology team that understands accessible technology and how to assess that? And then on your marketing communications team, do people know how to add simple things like 
Do you caption your videos? Do you add alternative text to your images? Do you know how to use the accessibility checker features in Microsoft, Apple, Office Suites and Adobe Suites to check for accessibility before you publish a, a document, an electronic piece of information. Those pieces are really simple and they're all built in, but those small steps can make everything you do more inclusive and it only adds a few minutes of time to learn, but the reach and expanse you have is massive. So I'm talking about from the social model of disability where we're talking about all the good reasons to include things. Um, on the business economic model, mitigating your risk of being sued for not being accessible and inclusive wow. is a big concern. And in the US that tends to be a lead, but that tends to look to make things on a checklist of compliance versus actually integrated accessibility. So um, both net gains, but the purpose and outcome I think is better if we work from inclusion as a, as a positive approach. <laughs> Percentage of organizations, you've got 30,000 members, percentages of those organizations, where are where do you see most of your your members? Are they like zero to one, one to two, three to four? Um, our organizational members uh, usually have a team of accessibility experts that are that are the members. And so they work really hard in their digital space or technical space or communication space usually. And so they're pushing and driving because it's part of their mandate or part of their culture. So those companies have um, are more advanced and more mature, but that's because somewhere in their team, they have a champion for accessibility and yeah. somebody in that champion has decided it's more than one person. <laughs> so, um, so some companies are great. I don't know that any company anywhere is fully all the way to over to five. You know, they're, they're not pushing the envelope. They're not going to 11. <laughs> so there's yeah. always room because every day when we produce new content or new platforms, there's always room to improve and change um, to, to meet the needs of, of wider audiences. So I think that if I were to take a pass, just anecdotally me speaking, I'd say that, 50 to 60% of the companies around the world might have some component of accessibility as part of their documented policy and procedure. And the well, others probably, they may have it, but it may not be documented. Like it might not be part of their protocol. And anybody starting from somewhere is better than nothing. So we encourage and, and celebrate everybody making, making moves forward, so. So one of the things that I've heard recently, personally, um, is and, and not only in one on one discussions, but online in social, is that many companies talk the talk, um, like you had just said, but it's they the words that they use is that it's just lip service. So, what should they do if there is an opportunity that a job that a candidate is really interested in applying for or in you know in pursuing? Do you have any specific suggestions on how they might in a in, and in what fashion and what style should they approach the recruiter or the hiring manager to say, have you thought of and what, what do you think about that? I think that's a great approach. I think what we're seeing now, I mean, I think if we had this discussion six months ago. It might be a little different, but I think right now um, in recruiting and hiring and searching out next opportunities, um, who you know is really important. So I think if you find a company and you can find that they actually have a diversity and inclusion team, um, if there's a challenge in that pipeline of getting into your interest is perhaps to write to that DNI team, DEI, and say, hey, I'm facing a challenge in applying for this role. Can you help me? <laughs> um, can you help me get to the right person? And so because I've Somebody who's on a DNI team, whether it's you know part of a volunteer structure or or a paid staff member, ideally they should recognize that and then try to go remove that barrier, um, not necessarily make a direct connection. So that's that's a great way to start. But really, so many people in the accessibility community, um, we look to one another to help people find inroads at companies. And so I think the accessibility community is really open and. Uh, really great advocates and and are more than willing to help is the way we find in other groups that are underrepresented and um, and under included <laughs> um, yeah. women minorities uh, 
gender specific and the sexuality, racial, ethnic, all of those groups, I think we see power uh, communities growing to help one another foster that community and help build. And so I think the accessibility community is there. And if you're not part of it, just find somebody and say, hey, I, I want to learn more. I want to do more or I need help. So um, and your association is not just for companies. Individuals can be part of that, too. Is that correct? Is. We yeah. have we have individual memberships and professional organizational memberships. So we have, I'd say the majority of our uh, memberships are personal, like individual professional members. Oh, wow. um, and then a large bit of, bit of them big swath are companies. So um, we were originally founded by a group of 40 companies that decided accessibility needs to be part of what we're doing. We need to identify a profession across markets and across industries so that we can start establishing that this is a thing, um, not just the tech guys and not just the HR people. And But uh, the foundation of that association, if I read correctly, did start from technology. Is that right? They were tech, tech companies. Yes, it was. They were they were all companies with a focus in technology. Interesting. I always like to talk about implications. Um, is there research that actually shows if companies are truly walking the walk down the path of DEI, accessibility, part of that, um, that their revenue is better, or that their profits are better, that their market share is better. And you come from a marketing and branding stand, you know, background. So it's very interesting to me, your background led you to accessibility. So I'm thinking that you, you have some kind of a, an insight on that. What are your thoughts? So in, in the UK, there's a movement called the Purple Pound, and that's purple being representative of people with disabilities and the pound being their currency. In the US, um, one, I think it's 27% of people in the US have, uh, have a disability that they have noted. And so if you consider 27% of the market, and if your choice in your pipeline for your sales funnel, for your conversions is, I want to start out by eliminating almost 30% of the market. I don't think anyone is going to take that path. If you want share of market and you know that 27% of the people with income in the US that's more than $6 billion, people with disability is, is second only to um, African American community and a Latino community in the US as far as a group with disposable income. If you intentionally want to exclude those people from your possible audience, possible customers, then go ahead and start at 78% of market and then reduce down your options from there. So if you want to look at pure ROI, it's less than seven seconds for somebody who uses assistive technology to head a website and realize it doesn't work and never go back. I'm so, stuck on $6 billion. <laughs> I'm stuck on two numbers. 27% of the, the, the U.S. population have a disability. Mm -hmm. And are we talking like my reading glasses? Is that No, that I'm talking about like medical diagnosis. Like medical diagnosis. Okay. So we're not talking about reading glasses. All right. So we're. No, but, but like reading disorder, dyslexia, um, uh, so, you know, blind and legally blind means you can't yeah. see and oh, also also I can't see but um, because someone is blind doesn't mean they have no vision so um, deaf and hard of hearing um, physical disabilities mobility impairments cognitive disabilities so there's lots of different types of disabilities um, so how we present and engage to this huge component of the population I I can't imagine, I've not yet had a conversation with a director of marketing or a VP of sales who says, yeah, I want to reduce my possible market share by 27%. Nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to say, hey, there's $6 billion in disposable income out there. I don't want any of it. All right. And I think that um, we're going to wrap up this half, <laughs> this half hour with that convincing uh, and very compelling argument to move forward with accessibility plans within an organization. And I don't think it's just an organization, Samantha. I think that it's each individual has to start removing that emotional or mental barrier that prevents them from thinking about the 27% of our population in the United States that has a disability. Yep. I mean, they're not, they're, frankly, I don't think they're top of mind. Do you? 
not for everyone. I mean, for everybody, right? Just for the common, just for. I mean, I I'm, I'm guilty. I am I am just as guilty of, of that. And and it's probably because I'm so used to working in a creative domain that we have all walks of life, right? And 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 from and and you know that marketing creative services. It's it's a very I mean, we, we just naturally go towards talent. You know, do you have that talent? Yes or no. I don't care how you do it. <laughs> we'll make sure that you can do what you do. Um, but the, the, that, that is not commonplace, right? It's, not, it's been really interesting to see the gaming community. So there's Microsoft oh, and, yeah. and Nintendo and all these switches are what they're called. And it enables people to not have to use a keyboard and a joystick. So there's all sorts of adaptive controllers that are coming into mainstream through children and young people. I'm saying young people as younger than myself that game on a regular basis. So we're starting to see inclusion come into electronic devices in the home more frequently. So I think it's shifting and I'm really glad to see that. So, but if you have any questions about accessibility or what you can do as an individual one step at a time or baby steps, I'm always game to talk about accessibility. I'm oh, about an accessibility geek like I'm a data and marketing geek. So that's wonderful. Samantha, thank you so much. I'm glad you mentioned the gaming thing because I'm a casual gamer and I've noticed that they've made them bigger. <laughs> they've made the graphics bigger and they've made the they've changed the colors on some of the the fonts and they they've allowed us to make them, you know, full screen. They you didn't always used to be able to go full screen. So I'm very happy about that. Yeah, bigger text and captions just came to gaming for one of the big companies yeah. and audio descriptions for some of the yeah. games as well for people who are blind who game. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So, Samantha, very interesting. Thank you so much for your time. I will be posting this recording to YouTube. It will have closed captions on Hooray. it. It will be live on, uh, or it will be recorded on LinkedIn. I will share that closed caption version for everybody on LinkedIn as well. And please, if you have any other questions on how to help your organization move towards uh, advancement in accessibility or DEI, please talk to Samantha or any of the people that we've had on Live with Lee. So thank you so much. You guys have a great afternoon. Samantha, I will talk to you in just one second. Don't hang up right away. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Ed.